Well, we're doing this series during the month of August um, honoring Unity's co-founders Charles and Myrtle Fillmore because they were both born during the month of August. And uh, one of the things that I think many people find attractive about Unity is that uh, we welcome and we encourage the uh, exploration of other spiritual and religious traditions. Now, for those like me who grew up in a Orthodox Christian tradition, we didn't have that kind of freedom growing up. That kind of thing was forbidden. You weren't supposed to study other religions. You were supposed to stick to your own group, stick to your own tribe, and that kind of thing. And of course, as I think back on it, it seems kind of it seems kind of strange because a after all, this country is supposed to be the land of the free, home of the brave, but definitely the land of the free where we have this Bill of Rights that guarantees us the freedom to practice our own religion, any religion, or none at all. Now, you wouldn't know that today even to listen to some of the more uh, fundamentalist Christians in this country. They still refuse to recognize the validity of any faith other than their own version of Christianity. Case in point, not all that long ago, 2007 was the first time in the history of this country that a Hindu was asked to give the morning invocation in the United States Senate. Think about that. First time. First time in the history of this country. The Hindu chaplain's name was Rajan Zed, this fellow right here. He's from Reno, just up the hill. Um, and, and you know he looks like a pretty happy guy, doesn't he? He looks like he looks like a happy guy. This is a big day for him. Imagine that he's going to give the invocation in front of the United States Senate. So he's he's introduced to the assembly by the presiding senator, and as he steps up to the microphone, people up in the spectator area start heckling him. Apparently, there was this group of fundamentalist Christian activists who heard that he was going to be invited to do this. They made a special trip to decide to shout him down. And they started shouting things like, Lord Jesus, forgive us, Father, for allowing a prayer of the wicked, which is an abomination in your sight. That's straight out of Leviticus. This is an abomination. We shall have no other gods before you. Now, as was entirely appropriate, they were quickly rounded up and removed by the sergeant at arms, and the opening prayer went on as planned. Now, now these protesters, they were from an organization called Operation Save America. Later that same day, they issued a press release to, to, make, to, make, clear, to make clear that they were the ones who were being persecuted because they'd been removed from the Senate chambers. You see how that works? They were the ones being persecuted. So here's a quote from the press release. They said, the Senate was opened with a Hindu prayer placing the false god of Hinduism, which proves they know nothing about Hinduism, placing the false god of Hinduism on a level playing field with the one true God who just so happens to be our Christian Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This would never have been allowed by our founding fathers. So, that's what is still going on in this country. These folks sound more like the Taliban or ISIS. That's what they're all about. And in the same way that the Taliban and ISIS do not speak for the majority of Muslims in the world, Operation Save America does not speak for the majority of Christians in this country. All the way back in 1889, the Fillmores wanted to see the world evolve beyond that kind of bigotry and intolerance. That's why they made it part of their mission to study other religions. To quote Charles Fillmore, here's what he said on the subject. He said, we have been readers among all schools of thought, and we find good in all of them. We do not claim to have discovered any new truths, nor have had any special revelation of truth. There's that theme again that he keeps saying. We are having no special revelations of truth here. 
There is truth in every religion. It is my privilege to take truth from any source, put it into my religion, and make it a fundamental rule of action in my life. Now that's a statement of a free thinking person, somebody who is claiming freedom to take truth from any source wherever we may find it. Now you might think that he's exaggerating just a teensy bit when he, when he says all schools of thought, but take a look at this next slide here. <laughs> now I don't expect any of you to be able to read this. <laughs> I have to get right up on it to be able to see what some of these things say, but this just gives you an idea. This is from a publication called Modern Thought in 1889. That was the 1800s version of Unity Magazine, by the way. It's a listing of all the books and pamphlets from those other schools of thought that he was talking about. And so they published and they sold these different things, which really shows you that the Fillmores were part of an ecumenical revolution in this country. And as we can see from this, when Charles started out, he was taking what you might call a shotgun approach. There is so much stuff up there. He, there are books and pamphlets about yoga, Buddhism, Islam, Christian science, Swedenborg, the Rosicrucians, Egyptology, indigenous religions, I mean, all over the place. And, and there was a time when Charles thought that unity could be all things to all people. And I think he finally realized that it would probably take more than a couple of lifetimes to study everything that it would take to do that in, in, in any way that, uh, that, 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 wasn't, that wasn't shallow. You know, you, you would end up with something scattered, or, or there's a phrase they, they use, uh, they, they, they say it's a, it's a mile wide and an inch deep, right? Charles wanted something that was deep, and he took a more narrow approach in order to be able to do that. So if I had to come up with the three faith traditions that have had the greatest influence on the unity movement, it would be the Judeo-Christian heritage, Buddhism, and the Hindu tradition. And coincidentally, all of this month at Spirit Wind on Thursday evenings, you can come and listen to more information about the Hindu and the Buddhist uh, traditions. But back in the day when the Fillmores were doing their thing, people in this country knew very little about Buddhist and Hindu religions. Um, it was in 1893 at the Parliament of uh, World Religions that was held in Chicago that year, 1893, that the teachings of Hindu Vedanta and Zen Buddhism were first introduced to the general public in the West. And even then, even then, most Buddhist writings had not been translated into English yet. So we can see, once again, that Charles Fillmore was ahead of his time. He really anticipated our, our modern Western fascination with Hindu and Buddhist traditions. And I, th I think the reason we have such a fascination with those traditions in this country is because Hinduism and Buddhism, they place experience and practice above authority and revelation. Their traditions are practical. When a person engages the practices, they can learn things about themselves, they can learn things about the mind, about consciousness, about relationships. They can get that by direct experience instead of relying on someone to hand it to them, to tell them about it, instead of relying on faith and revelation. Now Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, they didn't offer this kind of practical experience, uh, at least for lay people. That was something that was reserved for people who were clerics, who were monks, and that kind of thing. You could find Sufi mystics like Rumi, we've all heard of Rumi, or you can uh, think about Christian mystics like Meister Eckhart, who engaged in practices and, and said things that were inclusive and empowering, but they were suppressed. They were branded as heretics. Their writings were banned and sometimes even worse. There was a Sufi mystic whose name was Mansur al-Halaj. 
he dared to teach that the truth of God could be found outside the Muslim faith and that people were one with God. The Muslim caliph had him executed for heresy in the year 922. So that kind of teaching, offering experience, and empowering the ordinary person was something that was uh, simply not tolerated. Now the Hindu and Buddhist traditions, they didn't have that problem. They had a very different perspective on reality. For Buddhists and Hindus, reality and consciousness are intermingled in, in all sorts of different ways that anyone, anyone can study and experience without having to have a middle person in the way. They didn't insist on belief in a creator God. In fact, Buddhism is considered non-theistic. No personal God entities are required. Hindu and Buddhist traditions don't claim that they have all the answers, and Charles Fillmore agreed. To him, truth was too big to be contained in the teachings of just one religion. And yet, that's exactly what we tend to hear from fundamentalist, orthodox, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam still today. They insist that theirs is the only path to God, the only container of eternal and immutable truth. And do you know how they know that? Do you know how they know <laughs> that they've got the exclusive truth? Because their holy books say so. How convenient. I like to use the example of the napkin religion. Anybody ever hear of the napkin religion? Here's a visual for you. The napkin religion. It's got a napkin up there and it's written on the napkin are the words, the napkin religion is the one true religion because it says so right here on this napkin. There you go. That sums it up. And of course down there in small print it says, hey, that seems legit, <laughs> right? The napkin, in fact, I'm thinking of making a paper napkin just like that and I'm going to keep it handy near the door for when certain folks come a knocking and they want to, you know, they want to witness about the one true religion in their holy book, I can pull out the napkin. Some, somehow, I, I think the satire would be lost on them, but I'll, I'll let you know how it goes. So, back to that earlier quote from Charles Fillmore, the one where he said that there is truth in all religions. What I want us to notice here is what he is not saying, okay? Notice what he's not saying. He's not saying all religions are true. That's a crucial distinction. That's a crucial insight. Charles, in those early days, was demonstrating something that is coming to be known as integral consciousness. Now, the theory around that says that integral consciousness is a stage of human development or human evolution that we have just started moving into today. The integral worldview says that all truth is partial. No single group or individual has an exclusive claim to truth. Now probably one of the most prolific and, and well-known authors on the subject of, uh, of uh, integral theory is Ken Wilber, and he wrote a book uh, not too long ago called uh, Integral Spirituality, which uh, is pretty well known. And uh, here is what Ken Wilber has to say on the subject. He says, I have one major rule. Everybody is right. More specifically, everybody, including me, has some important pieces of truth. And all of those pieces need to be honored cherished, and included in a more gracious, spacious, and compassionate embrace. Then there's another book where he's quoted as saying this. He says, an integral approach is based on one basic idea. No human mind can be 100% wrong, or we might say nobody is smart enough to be wrong all the time. <laughs> And, and I, I, I can't resist, but the corollary of that has to be that nobody is dumb enough to be right all the time, right? And, and I love that part in that first quote about how all of the pieces of truth need to be 
honored, cherished, and included in a more gracious, spacious, and compassionate embrace. That's almost poetic. Well, that was the vision that the Fillmores had for unity, to take all those pieces, to search for truth from any source, and to bring it together, and to offer it for your perusal and approval. I think that's probably the big reason why they chose the name Unity for this new movement. Can, can you see how that fits? The integral vision looks at the world from multiple perspectives. This is a new stage of consciousness because for much of our human history, multiple perspectives were forbidden. Your culture, your tribe, your church determined your worldview. Your political party determines your worldview. And it was all male dominated. All of that started to change during the Enlightenment in the 1700s. And it's a process that continues today. Except now, we know it's happening. We can see it. We can shape it. The Fillmores embraced it. They saw the possibility of science and spirituality coexisting, which is another part of the integral worldview. Science may one day be able to explain human consciousness based on physics, biology, chemistry, whatever, and that's because science excels at answering questions. But there are some questions maybe that science will never be able to answer. For instance, why is art, in all of its many forms, moving and inspiring to human beings? How do we find meaning in our lives? What is the most beneficial way to coexist with our fellow human beings and other life forms on this planet, and maybe someday beyond this planet? Those are the questions I think that spirituality is best suited to address. If science can ultimately establish a physical basis for consciousness, it still won't be able to tell us how to best use this quality or process or whatever it happens to be. There are questions that don't have a single certain answer, and those are the ones that fall within this broad realm of spirituality, philosophy, ethics, Aesthetics, what I like to call the intangible side of reality, which is so important, and we need that perspective to be in balance. So the integral worldview really gives us a more complete picture of reality, which I think is one of the great ideas that unity brings to the world. And as I said last week, not all ideas withstand the test of time. That's how it goes, right? There are some ideas that Charles wrote about that we don't teach anymore. They're no longer valid. They've been overtaken and made obsolete by new discoveries. And I think he'd be okay with that. He always reserved the right to change his mind, which is one of the greatest qualities of the scientific method. New evidence comes along. You change your theory. It's okay to be wrong. It's part of the process. If your hypothesis doesn't hold up to the evidence, start over again. Take a new approach. If new discoveries prove an old theory to be wrong, back to the drawing board. That's the way it works. That's, that's how evolution works. Carl Sagan once said that extinction is the rule. Survival is the exception. Now, if that sounds a little bit negative, I, I would encourage you to look at it from another perspective. <laughs> because the fact is that the history of life on planet Earth is filled with stories of evolutionary dead ends. And that's the way that new and more adaptable species come into existence, including us, which is why we need to keep evolving that's how new and more adaptable ideas come into existence. If an idea hasn't panned out, if we can't see that it's practical and it works, then it's time to let it go. It's time to let it go. And that is called change, which doesn't come easy to humankind. But think about it. What are some of the things that don't change? 
things that are usually dead, right? You know, they, 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 they never change. That, that's, that is the way of the universe. And so that's where we're going to uh, pick up again next week when we talk about unity today. What's changing? More importantly, what needs to change? See you then.